Okay, we should be live in a moment. And it looks like we are live. Hello and welcome to the MMA Live Chat Show. I'm Rich Davy, and it's Tuesday, October 28th, 2014. On today's show, we'll be discussing the Tough 20 Episode 6 show featuring the matchup between Isling Daly and Angela Magana. And maybe we'll chat a bit about the Episode 5 show that featured the fight with Felice Herrig and Heather Joe Clark. On today's show, we have yours truly, Fred Kirby, and Eddie Law. Thanks for taking part in another show, guys. I appreciate you all taking the time to be here and joining me to discuss the Tough 20 Episode 6 show and for sharing your thoughts on the matchup between Isling Daly and Angela Magana. Go ahead and say hello to anybody that might be listening, guys. Yo, what's up, Eddie? What's happening, Rich? Hey, what's up, fellas? What's going on? <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm doing good, fellas. Glad you guys could make it. I truly appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. The Tough 20 Episode 6 show featuring the matchup between Isling Daly and Angela Magana takes place Wednesday, October 29th, 2014 on the Tough 20 Episode 6 show and will be on Fox Sports 1 starting at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Okay, Isling Daly versus Angela Magana. We have uh, the 26-year-old Isling Daly who has a record of 14-3 and in Hales from Ireland. In the Season 1 opener, she was ranked or seeded number 5 by the powers that be. And then we have the 30-year-old Angela Magana hailing from the USA with a record of 11 and 6 and in the season opener she was ranked or seeded number 12. Um, obviously Isling Daly is the favorite here as she is the higher ranked fighter in this matchup but uh, both of these fighters have a little more experience than uh, some of the other ladies or most of the other ladies in the house actually um, so this should prove to be an exciting fight. Uh, as a matter of fact I noticed on Facebook last night that Isling Daly posted a comment stating that the fight was an exciting one and I thought that I had read uh, that she made a comment about it being the most exciting fight to date, but when I went back today to get that exact quote, I couldn't find it. So maybe that, maybe that was in my imagination there, but <laughs> there was a comment from Eisen Daly that read, tune in this Wednesday, Thursday, but only if you want to be really entertained. Um, both of these ladies have fought some tough competition over the years. Daly has fought Sheila Gaff, uh, Rosie Sexton, uh, Barb Honchak, and Lisa Ellis, who is also on the season of Tough, but she came up short in each of those matches, um, losing by a unanimous decision in three rounds to uh, Sexton, Han Chank, and uh, Lisa Ellis, and uh, my first round TKO to Sheila Gap back in 2011. Uh, coming into this fight, she has a win by submission of the fight that took place on December 31st, 2013, and her record for the last couple of years is one win and three losses. So. Uh, it looks like maybe she's trying to get back on the um, the winning train here. Uh, I'm not sure why, but the fight record on Tough is a little bit different than what Share Dog's Fight Finder is showing. So I'm going to go with uh, Share Dog here since their info is a little bit more comprehensive. On Share Dog's Fight Finder page for daily, she has 14 wins, five by KO or TKO, seven by submission, and two by decisions. And in her loss column, uh, she has five losses, one by KO, TKO, and then four by decision. Uh, looking at Angela Magana, Angela has fought some pretty tough competition as well. She has three fights against Jessica Aguilar, uh, losing two of those three matches. And her win over Jessica Aguilar was uh, the third of the three fights that they had together. So the last fight that she had with her, she did win that fight against uh, Jessica Agro, who's I believe the champion over at Bellator right now. Um, and uh, let's see, Jessica Agro, uh, she won by majority decision, and that was back on January 16th of 2009. She, she also has fought Bob uh, Barba Honchak, and she won by split decision uh, back in 2009. So we got one fighter that has the win over Barb, and another one has a loss. Um, but she also uh, has losses to uh, Jessica Penny, Jessica I, and Stephanie. I'm going to get this lady's wrong name wrong here because I always do. Stephanie Agink, um, two by submission and one by unanimous decision. So I guess it's a good thing that she's uh, not fighting another fighter with the name of Jessica in this matchup <laughs> because that's four of her six losses to fighters with the first name of Jessica. <laughs> 
And over at Share Dog, uh, her record is the same as what they were showing on Tough there. Um, she has 11 wins, 2 by KO or TKO, 6 by submission, and 3 by decision. And in her loss column, she has 6 losses, 4 by submission, and 2 by decision. So the two fighters are pretty evenly matched here, which should make for a great fight here. And, and uh, Fred, give me your comments, uh, comments on this matchup here. And uh, who do you think comes out the winner, and how do you think it's going to end? Well, like you said, um, Isling Daly is the favorite, and uh, I would rate her as the favorite going into this fight. I think that's uh, rightfully given that she's uh, Isling Daly's got an interesting style, man. She um, she uses lots of pressure, lots of forward movement. Um, she tra trains out of the same camp as Conor McGregor, the straight blast gym in Ireland, and uh, she's been there forever too. She's actually, like you said, she's been on the circuit for a very long time. She's got a lot of experience. And um, <clears throat> I think she's even taken a lot of fights, or quite a few fights, uh, above this weight category. So I think that she'll be pretty strong for the weight division. Um, I think that her, her use of pressure and uh, uh, forward movement in her hands is going to be a big factor in this fight. Angela Magana is interesting because <clears throat> she just shot this documentary where she went to Thailand uh, to train Muay Thai. And she decided to stay because she fell in love with the art and Thailand and whatnot. Um, but watching her fights, uh, I can kind of see why she went to Thailand. Uh, <laughs> she's actually rather slick on the ground, and most of her wins by submission, or quite a few rather. And um, her striking was a bit rudimentary, and it looks like it's actually helped her out a lot going to Thailand. Obviously, it's tightened up her striking a lot. Um, but her striking isn't necessarily as great as one would might think with her living in Thailand. As far as them matching up together, um, I just see Daly applying a lot of pressure, as she does in her fights. I see her coming forward and not really stopping. Um, Maganya can be pretty crafty off of her back, but I think that Daly has been around long enough to not get caught in something stupid. And uh, she's an aggressive fighter, too. So I, I just see Daly coming out, putting a ton of pressure on her, driving her up against the fence, eventually getting the takedown, and uh, pretty much mall dogging her. Um, I think Daly is going to get a first round TKO finish and make a statement with this fight. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay. Eddie, what do you think? All right, man. Now, this is a fight that when I saw the matchup, I gotta say I was a little bit upset because I kind of wanted to see him uh, face off later in later rounds, not necessarily now, because of the wealth of, of experience that both of these ladies have. Uh, like I said, Magana, 30 years old, a mountain of experience. Daly, 26 years old, and has a mountain of experience on her own, especially with the team that she trains with, and and like Fred said, uh, took fights at a higher weight than she is now. Now, here's the thing about it: is this, this fight is so evenly matched in my mind. I mean, um, I believe, uh, I think Daly has a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. I, I think it's, that's what it is. Um, Maganya has, is very, very slick on the ground, just like Fred said. But the standout that both of these ladies have it might make this fight interesting. If you're watching any of the, uh, the Daly fights, she doesn't really shy away from any, from any, uh, from contact. She, she, in fact, she, she prefers it. But uh, she's also very, very smart, and she does like to uh, take people down and just basically, you know, but win by submission the way she's, she's done most of her, most of her fights. Um, Magana, on the other hand, uh, has that Thailand training. Now, again, you know, she, isn't, she hasn't been there that long, so she hasn't picked up what we expect out of, you know, professional Thai fighters as far as the skill on, on the feet, but she has improved quite a bit. Um, as far as the fight goes, I hate to pick it because, again, I wanted, to fight, I wanted to fight later in the later rounds, um, but uh, I would actually have to go with, with daily by submission. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree with you more than I am with Fred there. Not that you know Fred doesn't have valid points in everything that he said, um, but uh, my breakdown here was looking at their records. It would be anybody's guess as to who wins if the fight goes to a decision, because both of the ladies you know have gone to decision, and uh, it's it's hard to tell if it goes to a decision. You know, you know, would they be split decisions more than likely? Yes. Um, so hard to say if it does go to decision who might wind up becoming the winner, but I don't think it's going to go to a decision. I'm also thinking along the lines that it's probably going to be a finish of some sort here. And uh, looking at the KOs and subs in 
in their win-loss columns, it's still difficult to actually, you know, call how this one might end because they both, you know, are pretty good on the ground and they both have, you know, a fairly good amount of submissions. Um, I don't know. To me, it looks like the K or TK on, uh, finish is unlikely and that this fight more than likely, you know, like, like uh, Eddie was saying here, I think it's more than likely going to go to the ground at some point here. And if that is the case, um, I think, you know, a submission favors Iceland Daly there because I think it's going to wind up being, a, you know, a grappling event more than a standing event. Um, because, again, this is their first fight in the house. And I'm pretty sure they're not going to bang the hell out of each other just standing there and banging. You know, so if they've got another fight down the road in the next bracket, I don't think they're going to want to stand there and bang and put it all on the line. So I think it's probably going to go to the ground. I think it's going to be a submission. And I think in this instance here, um, I think it's going to favor um, Eisen Daly. Uh, you know, and even though Angela Gagne has a good ground game, you know, I, and like Fred was saying there earlier, uh, Eisen Daly has fought at 125. And she looks to be a bit bigger than some of the other women in the house. So as long as she doesn't struggle cutting weight, I, I think she gets the win here. And I'm going to agree with uh, Eddie here, and I'm going to go with Isaac Daly by 7-2. See, but here's the thing, though. The, the reason that I think that it'll end up being a TKO finish is just like both of you guys are saying, they're both competent grapplers. And usually when you get two competent grapplers at this level, it's extremely hard to um, get a submission. Now, could Daly get a submission from top? Very well could. But that's exactly why I'm picking her, because I feel like at some point she'll get the takedown. And even though Magana is really crafty off of her back, I don't think that she's high level enough to get a submission off of her back. Um, I just don't think that either one of these girls is really going to get submitted. And I know magania has got really good submission defense, too, so... That's just what um, makes me lean towards a more of a TKO finish than I do. Well, again, Magana has four losses by submission. Yeah, fair enough, but she, she's she been grappling for a long time, and she knows her, her shit as far as submission defense goes. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's one thing we can't overlook as far as... Uh, well, let's look at the submission losses for, for, for Angela first. Two to Jessica Aguilar, both submissions. The second one was a technical submission, what they call it, with blood in the eye, according to Sherdog. Um, Jessica Penn submitted her. Um, Stephanie Egging submitted her. So, yeah, she can be submitted, but those aren't, you know, low-level, you know, white belt, you know, jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu practitioners. Um, what I will say about Magana, though, is do not sleep on her arm bar. She will sneak that little mother effort anytime she wants to. It's, it's, and, it's, and it's never... Like, it almost seems like her opponents never see it coming because it is very, very, very just, just like, sneaky. That one second you're, you know, fighting something else off, the next thing, you know, next thing you know, your arm's torn, torn off your body. It doesn't even, you know, she doesn't even care. She'll pull that shit right off. But, um, I mean, I, I'm not underestimating you know, Angela at all. Like I said, I hate picking this fight because I'm, I'm a fan of both. And I think both, um, had they not been matched up together, could have had a legitimate shot to move on to the next round and maybe face each other, in, in, you know, later on. But, uh... I mean, man, hell, I'm excited for the fight. Just, just, uh, I, I, Rich, as you said, when uh, you know, I guess Daily put out like, that, that comment you were talking about, but it being an exciting fight, I can't wait till tomorrow's episode. Yeah, I think actually this one will probably have the potential to be the most exciting fight so far. I mean, up until this point in, in the tough season, uh, the first most exciting fight was the first fight with Randa Marcos and Tisha Torres, and then the one with Felice Herrig and, uh, and Heather Joe Clark. And I think this one has the potential to go above and beyond that because. You know, with all the experience that these two have, and you know, again, it's not like, you know, we're looking at a striker versus a grappler here. We got, you know, two ladies that can both grapple, and, and you know, uh, it looks like, you know, maybe they're not afraid to go out there and, and you know, duke it out as well. So, I mean, and and the thing that I was saying there is, you know, I I don't know if you guys feel that it's a, a valid argument or not, but being that this is the first fight for these two ladies in the first bracket where they're having a, a fight. I, I just don't see them going out and putting it all on the line and, you know, going balls to the wall and, and trying to take each other out with, you know, striking, you know, which is why I'm, I'm thinking that it goes to the ground. You know, what are your comments on that, guys? I mean, as far as, you know, do you think that's a valid argument? Do you think they will go out and blast each other? Or do you think, you know, they, they might 
want to say, okay, well, rather than, you know, take a chance and, you know, getting cut open and, and getting eliminated, you know, maybe it would be better, you know, to take it to the ground and look for a submission. That, <clears throat> that's a double-edged sword, too, though. I mean, you know, not everybody can take the big country route and actually pull it off and go in there and fight a safe fight and win. I'm sure that that would be the game plan for most of these ladies, you know, go in, win as quickly as possible and take as least damage as possible. But in order to get those emphatic wins, sometimes you've got to kind of throw caution to the wind. You've got to stand in the pocket and trade a little. Uh, in order to, to get a finish, a lot of times you've got to put yourself in a position to be finished, whether it's getting in range to strike or choosing submission over position. You know, I, I don't know. On one hand, I, I understand what you're saying, but then on the other, I kind of feel like they both want to advance in this tournament and they're just going to try to come out and fucking destroy one another. So that they, you know, both these girls need that spot. They're going to get a little time to heal after this. You don't want to ride out of, you, you definitely don't want to uh, be on the, the losing end of a boring decision. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know, man. I'm hoping, I'm hoping for the latter that they come out and just try to finish one another as quickly as possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was going to be an exciting fight. I mean, look, I, I'm the guy that, you know, during... You know, last week's uh, or last, was it Saturday's fights, USC 179. I was entertained as hell with Ferreira and uh, and Benil, and they were grappling most of the time. So, um, it, it uh oh, and also with the uh, the uh, fucking what's his name, Touchy Feely, Andre Feely. Mm -hmm. Also with his fight, I enjoy, I enjoy grappling matches. So if it's exciting in that in that aspect, that'd be great. But um, what about Phil Davis? Yeah, uh, yeah, Phil Davis, man. I. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I can't. Uh, I like jujitsu, not not much wrestling. <laughs> okay. Anyway, no, nah, that was a cool. One. But anyway, uh, back to, to this fight. Um, here's what here's what I think. I think the strategy for a lot of these a lot of these you know ladies is just like just like as we're saying is take the least amount of damage, finish the fight as fast as possible, and win. I think a lot of that happens throughout that feeling out process. Once you feel that they figure each other out on the feet, and they go, okay, this is how this might go, or I have an, I might have an advantage with this, or you know. Um, it all. I think it all depends on that first round, but I. I don't know. I just don't think that they really want to blast each other that much. Um. But again, I mean, you never know. Let's say it gets down to that, you know, last minute and a half in the second round, and you know, one of them thinks they're down. They might start throwing bombs and hope something goes, you know. But uh, ultimately, the the goal is to win the fight and then deal with the rest of it later. But um, I, I actually just, I just, I, I like seeing the jiu-jitsu stuff, so I wouldn't mind seeing that on the ground. But hell, man, if they come out blasting, that's going to be fun as hell to watch. Yeah. And I actually just pulled up uh, their information, their fight records on Sharedog there because, uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's just me, but when I was watching the show, it looked to me <clears throat> um, it looked to me that Eisen Daly was a bit larger. But um, I'm looking at the information on Sharedog here, and Angela Magania has also... Uh, at 125 as well, and that's what she's being listed at on um, the share dog site, and she's also one inch taller. So I thought maybe that would be a factor here. So maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I would, Angela, I would maybe Angela Magana might come out tall. looking to, to strike a little harder. You know, I wouldn't put a lot. I still think that Daly is a little bigger. Um, Magana may be an inch taller, and both of these ladies. These took fights above 115, but you got to imagine too that the the you know regional circuits for for the strawweight division for women was probably kind of slim to none four years ago. So a lot of these ladies probably took fights where they could get them against name competition. You know what I mean? But now that they're both cut, and I think that Daly, either way, even if she's not much bigger, I expect her to be more powerful. Certainly when they clinch up and they start grappling, I expect Daly to have an edge in the power department. Yeah, I thought so too. I just to me, she just looked to me, you know, looking at the other ladies on the show to be just a little bit bigger and you know a little bit more, a little bit more imposing than some of the other ladies. But I don't know. I was kind of shocked when I just looked at this here. Um, and even five foot three and five foot four—that's pretty short to be fighting at uh, one twenty-five. Yeah, I, I got to say, though, man, in most of Daly's fights, she is relentless. She comes straight ahead, and she doesn't really stop. It's almost like Chel Sonnen-esque. I mean, she does not stop until she's got a hold of you. She's very 
good at keeping the pressure applied. So um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, you can't really use a whole lot of those Muay Thai tricks and the leg kicks and all that shit when somebody's just coming directly at you straight on. So. Yeah, it'll be interesting because, like, you know, like I said earlier there, she teased the fact that it was going to be a really exciting fight. And that would lead you to believe that maybe there was a lot of striking. But, you know, also, like, you know, Eddie was saying there, great grappling contests on the ground with lots of jiu-jitsu can make for an exciting fight as well. Yeah, I mean, look at the background oh, yeah, I mean, of Bailey, too. They're coming out of the, out of the SVG gym. They, you know, they do, I mean, if you if I had to categorize SVG in a phrase, is no fucks given. Those guys and, and ladies come out to just, you know, to fight. They come out to fight and they come out to win. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. Daly's going to come up with the pressure and, and, and um, I'm, I just want to see the fight now, especially since she, since since you guys, you know, since since Rich mentioned the whole the comment she made. Now I really, really want to see it. So can't wait to see the fight. Me yeah, too. It totally be a fun grappling fight for sure. I mean, just because she said that it's a super exciting fight, by no means means that it's a stand up fight. I mean, it could. They're both very competent, good grapplers. But it could very well mean. Um, that, that it's a it's a really high paced, high octane grappling match. I wouldn't necessarily say that, but um, yeah, you never know. Well, we all agree on one thing. We don't agree that I mean, we agree that it's not going to go to decision and that there's going to be a finish. So Fred thinks it's going to be more of a barn blaster there because he's picking TKO in one, and both uh, Eddie and I are picking submission in two. Okay. So. We, at least we do agree on that. We don't see it going to a decision, but I, you know, I'm wondering if we see the fight start on the half hour mark, then we know it's going to go to a third round. So, <laughs> yeah, I started I started picking up on that uh, on, on that right there when I'm watching it. I just check the time. I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be quick, or this is not going to be quick. Exactly. So keep in mind the pressure's on her to get that first win for Team Melendez. She the pressure's on her, and I know she she's got to be feeling it. She's got to want that first win for her team, um, but imagine if they lose. You know, like how? Uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys have been watching. I know Fred's been watching uh, Tough Line America, and Verdum knows damn well what that feels mm -hmm. like. Uh, my boys from Mexico are taking care of business, so um, this, this is this is a pretty much the exact same scenario, except Melendez has zero wins right now. So I mean, we'll, we'll see what they what they end up doing. Yeah, you know that's a valid point too, there because you know she's got to have that in her mind. Around, can I get the win? Um, you know, but again, she seems to be a, a pretty confident individual. So, who knows? Like I said, there maybe because she is just a little bit bigger height-wise, uh, maybe she will come out, you know, trying to blast and strike a little bit to, you know, maybe stun uh, Iceland Daly, and then maybe it'll go to the ground after that. But I, I still don't see this early in the competition of the tournament that, you know, two fighters going, you know, all out in a striking fashion. But I could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that Magana's strategy most certainly will be to come out and strike. Um, I, I definitely don't see her pressuring daily against the cage and getting an offensive tank down necessarily. So I would say Magana absolutely is going to try to come out and uh, probably keep her distance, strike from the outside, and keep daily off of her from a little while for a little while. Um, I, I don't know how successful she'll be in doing that, but I got to imagine that that would be the general game plan. She's crafty off her back, and 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 uh, Eddie makes a good point. Her arm bar is super slick, but I, I got to imagine that's a last resort type deal. She probably wants to come out, you know, use the newfound Muay Thai technique she's got, and then in a pinch, if she ends up on her back eating elbows, be able to resort to the arm bar then. But I can't imagine that's her plan necessarily. So, yeah, and being that she's also uh, Angela. I mean, not Angela, uh, Isling Daly, being that she also trains uh, in Ireland there. Uh, she's actually been around longer than Conor McGregor. I think she's been around for a year longer than before Conor McGregor had his first fight. Mm -hmm. So, yep, you're right. you, know, you know how those Irish fighters are. They do like to strike. Oh, they just like to fight, man. Uh, I have a couple, uh, a couple, I know in high school I had a couple Irish friends, and, um, the weird part is whenever I got into brawls, these two idiots are the ones that have my back. All my other friends were just pussies. So <laughs> these guys were like, these two guys were always like, yeah, we're down to fight, let's go. And I'm like, oh shit, all right, let's go, whatever. But I mean, I'm um, half Irish myself. I know I used to like to fight a lot when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, man, but uh, no, nah, it's just uh, it, it's always exciting when you see it. When you see, especially someone from that from that team, you know, um, oh, what's the name of the? Uh, I forget the names of the other fighters, but I know uh, Dayla was actually cornering one of her teammates, um, who lost his first fight. I think was uh, Patrick Holland. Patty Hoolan. Patty Hoolan. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hoolan. Um, so you know, they're they, they're they're a tight knit family, but they also you know they train together, they fight together. So, um, yeah, the Irish the Irish are here to to come and do. You guys, by the way, speaking on that topic, um, when Conor McGregor got shown on the on the jumbo on jumbo screen this last weekend, the, the like the reaction from the crowd was hilarious. Yeah, he didn't make a whole lot of fans down in Brazil with that Q and A session. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, but man, like I always say too, that's that's the kind of shit that I love. I mean, when's the last time you've seen a Q and A session like that, man? I mean, that dude is fucking. And on that topic, a little bit, like you said. It's I, I find a lot of interest in these in these new foreign markets producing talent. Like right now you got this talent streaming out of Ireland. I think that shit's interesting, man. Like the whole the whole angle for the new Latino tough, for me at least, is Mexico. And um, the talent that's gonna start coming out of there in the next couple of years, you know what I mean? Men and women and I just think it's interesting, man. And like you see uh, all these Irish fighters starting to get their due and, and starting to prove their metal and it's no fucking coincidence that they come from the same exact gym you know it's 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 not a coincidence it's something that they're doing right over there and it's fucking working and it's cool man i love it yeah man each one of those markets have their own leaders too you look at it connor's leading the, the you know the irish gustafson's leading uh the swedes i think yeah the swedes um came with you know with the mexicans uh I don't, I don't even know who, who was really leading the Brazilians. I'll just say Anderson Silva. But uh, each one has, like, that leader that kind of, like, paved the way, and all the younger fighters are just following them around, following them in, and using it as inspiration as the goal. You know, I, I mean, each each Mexican fighter, you can ask any of them that are doing MMA. They'll say, hey, I want to be, you know, I want to be like Kane, or I want to be like Diego Sanchez or, or Gilbert Melendez. You know, so um, it, it's very exciting to see those markets, um, in those areas come out with, with a – very, very hungry and very, very talented fighters into the UFC. Hey, Eddie, I see that we've got somebody watching along with us live here. Um, are there any comments from the viewer? No, not yet. We got, uh, we got four people, I think, or three people, including me, I guess. So, okay. um, no, we got nothing yet. All right, just wanted to let people know if they're uh, interested in making any comments. You can go ahead and make comments. It might take us a minute or two to get to you. Um, because it's a little bit of a delay before we actually get to see the comment and before you actually hear what we're saying. Um, okay, anything else on the uh, matchup between Isaac Daly and Angel Magani before we move on? Nope. Nope. <sighs> okay, well then we'll wrap that up and we'll move on here. Uh, um, okay, now that uh, Heather Clark has been eliminated from the tournament, um, I wonder if the aggression towards her is going to subside a bit. Um, you know, I actually started feeling bad for her. I mean, I know, uh, you know, in the beginning there, I was kind of like, you know, getting on her shit a little bit myself because she seemed to be a bit abrasive. But, man, I'm actually starting to feel bad for her the way that everyone is treating her. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I'm starting to, to wonder to myself how much is of that is editing, and you know, are they just you know trying to make a villain on the show or what? Um, but I wonder if any of that aggression is now going to subside, like I said. And then I'm also wondering if that aggression is going to transfer over to Tisha Torres, who is returning to fill the void left by Justine Kish, um, because she had to drop out due to a knee injury. And uh, it seems that nobody is particularly happy to see Torres back, except for Tisha Torres. And uh, as I mentioned on the last show, um, unfortunately you guys, you know, couldn't make that show. But uh, I mean, it's to be expected that Tisha Torres was to be picked to, you know, fill the void left by Justine Kish because she was the ranked uh, three fighter in the first episode. And uh, you know, it, it, you know, the thing that made me question why they would bring her back is, and you know, I want your opinion on this, guys. Um, she was complaining that she had an injury and that that injury is what hampered her performance against Randa Marcos. So, I mean, if that was in fact the reason that um, she didn't appear to be the fighter that someone expecting to see in that loss to Randa Marcos, was bringing her back, you know, as an injured fighter really the best decision to make when replacing Justine Kish? Or should they have looked to bring back a fighter that wasn't injured? 
you know? Yeah. Uh, first off, let me say that, uh, Rich, you're right. <clears throat> me and you do tend to disagree on a lot of shit. Whereas, <laughs> we, always, we always disagree. I'm, I'm shocked where, when we do agree. Where, whereas you turned around with Heather Joe Clark, I was kind of giving her the benefit of the doubt in the beginning. And by the end of this episode, I was like, you know what? It's enough with Heather Joe. I, I don't think the whole... <laughs> I don't dig the whole let's bury the hatchet thing. Piss on that. You know, you got that ass. Don't come out and try to be friendly now. I bet you wouldn't have been so friendly had you got a quick first round submission. You probably would have been nippy then, you know. Whatever. She's humbled. It's enough with her. Um, I don't know. Whatever. She she's starting to annoy me. Well, you're a little more you're a little more hard in your opinions than I am. I yeah, I'm a little bit more of a softy, you know. I mean I just no, no. In the beginning, I was kind of like that. I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, maybe her knees hurt or whatever. But then the episodes play out, and I'm like, yeah, fuck that. She's got to train too, Jack. Like, you know, well, what the fuck? She gets to hang out and get coaches too. <laughs> they're busting her ass. Their knees hurt. And then she's, you know, she gets her ass whooped, and she comes out, and she's wanting to squash the beef and whatnot. Fuck that. But <laughs> as far as Tisha Torres coming back, okay, so A – I totally see why they did it. it. You know, she's one of the higher ranked girls in the house. Um, you know, she probably deserves it, and she's got the best chance to actually win this thing. Now, why in the fuck would the other girls in the you house mean, be a stack? You mean, you mean out of back? any of the girls that have been eliminated so far, she has the best shot out of those girls? Well, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, I, absolutely. Of, of the girls that have been eliminated, she's got the best shot. But, but why? Of course the other girls don't like it. Now she gets back in the competition. Do the other girls that are going to continue to lose and the ones that have already lost, will they get another chance? Now, I realize it's nobody's fault that Justine Keish got hurt. You know, nope. It is what it is. But on the same token, if you're one of the girls that loses once and gets, you know, kicked out of the competition and Tisha Torres gets a free fucking pass because of somebody else's bad luck, I can't imagine... You know, and especially if I'm the girl that's got to fight you, <clears throat> and motherfucker, if Tisha Torres beats me in the second round, I'm going to be pissed. You shouldn't even be in the fucking competition, Jack. Yeah, I mean, she, was, she lost legitimately, so, you know, I can understand right. all, the, you know, all the people being upset about that. And not only that, I mean, uh, uh, Gilbert Melendez was upset because that was his number one pick, and he put so much into working with her, and then she got eliminated in the first round. And now she's coming back, and she's not only just coming back, she's going to the other fucking team. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it's it's uh, just like Fred said, you know, here's the thing, you're not fighting for, you know, a contract. Though. These girls are in. You're not fighting for being the ultimate fighter. They're all in there anyway. They're fighting for a belt. Tisha Tor is one of the most dangerous fighters on the planet at that weight especially. Okay. Would you be happy as fuck to have her back, having to fight her possibly to go get a belt? Fuck no. Nobody's happy about that. But in this situation, every, no matter what decision they were going to make, everything was screwed. Uh, let's say they don't bring anybody back. Somebody gets a buy? That's not really fair. Well, uh, one, more, back, one, more, one more viable thing that they could have done, which they've done in past seasons, is get somebody who didn't actually make it into the house but was there you know, prior to the fighters being picked to enter the house. I think that would have been more fair, you know? The number it's, 17 it's probably, person that they thought that was maybe number 17. Maybe that person should have got a shot instead of giving Tisha Torres, you know, a double shot at, at things, which is not fair, really. Yeah. I mean, and, and that might have been more fair, but again, this is reality TV, man. you got to come up with storylines because people got to watch. they got to have a reason to see it, especially, and I hate to give a stereotype, especially uh, the female audience. They're not necessarily going to tune in and watch two chicks scrap. You know I mean, um, they, they want to see, oh, my God, so also hates somebody else, and she's talk shit about her, and, oh, my God, her pains are up there. I don't know. <laughs> Me too. You know, it's, 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 yeah, exactly. But you gotta, you got to have that storyline, and um, you got to give them a reason to watch. So that's another reason to bring Tisha Torres back, Torres back. But uh, the thing I find the most like, awkward about the whole thing is putting her on the other team. Because Melendez was, was against it. He at least said something about give, give uh, Beck Rawlings a bye or something like that. Like, he, he preferred that over Tisha towards going over the other team. Because, look, it's like they're already stacked, and you want to give him Tisha too? Like, why don't we just give her the entire team Melendez? Fuck it. Like, what are we doing here? Yeah. But um, I, I don't know if you guys – I mean, I don't know. The only question I've had the entire season so far is when the fuck are we going to get to see Rose, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I want to see her fight really, really bad, and they haven't even bothered to bring her in yet. You know what it tells me? It tells me everyone's scared shitless of her, and I can't wait to see her come in. Yeah, because uh, even DFW said that there's a, a woman in the house who's actually the next uh, Ronda Rousey, and even Ronda Rousey picked Rose Navajunas as yeah. that individual, so more than likely we're going to see some slick submissions from her. Um, you know, and probably, no doubt, she's going to win her first fight, and maybe even the second one. Five yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, right? Yeah, flying arm bar. But, um, she, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I just wanna, I, I just, it's just weird to me that she hasn't fought yet. But, it, again, it tells you she might be that one that that, uh, that brings it for Team Melendez and gets those wins and possibly gets to the final. But, um, I don't know. I've been excited this entire season. This is one of the most exciting seasons I've, I've, been, uh, I've been watching. Um, besides, you know, the, the tough Latin America, but that's just that's honestly just a home country thing. I just I just love, I love my people. So, but um, yeah, definitely Thug Rose. Thug Rose got to come in. But again, back to your point, you were talking about Tisha Torres. Um, you know, it, nothing nothing that was gonna get done was gonna be fair at all. So he just said, you know what, screw it, get pissed if you want to, but this is the this is the choice to live with it. Yeah, you know, but you made that very valid point about taking all the top-rated fighters or seated fighters and putting them over on Pettis when they were already kicking ass. Yeah. I mean, why didn't they just switch to two positions then? Yeah, right. Because it's it's going to be it look, it's looking like it's it's going to be a sweep, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> if they keep on getting all of the you know the top-ranked fighters there. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you know, it's got to be doing you know some damage mentally on on Team Melendez there because. You know, I, it's got to be tough, fight after fight after fight, to see your fighters losing, and you, uh -huh. you know, now you're five and zero, oh and I mean, with what we're saying here and the way that we're predicting the outcome of this fight, it's likely that they'll be six and zero oh <laughs> after Wednesday's uh -huh. show. Yeah, but um, I I just think uh, I don't know. My my other thought too on Tish Torres is is how how she must feel. That's got to be awkward as hell, dude. You've been like, you know, against this team the entire time. Now you got to switch teams. And now the girls that you were training with, that you were friends with, you know, they're kind of, you know, they're the enemy now. It's it's so weird. It's weird, but it adds that interesting ass, this like angle to the entire show now. Especially if she wins her next fight. She wins her next fight, she might she might just piss off her old friends at Team Melendez, and now she's gonna be by herself an island. Yeah, and, and then you also have Carla Sparza, who's not a fan of right. hers. I don't know if you guys seen those nasty ass comments that she made about her. Did you guys see that? Uh, I don't know if it was a Twitter or a Facebook post or whatever, but she said some she nasty was, shit about her. She flat said the shit on the last episode. Like, yo, what the fuck? I ain't thrilled about that shit. Like, that's no, but I need some personal fucking insults. No, it's like, that. what Whoa. the fuck? No, no, yeah, I, I didn't see that. I didn't see yeah. that. But, but you know, another interesting point about all this is, let's just say, for the sake of argument that Pettis does sweep. What does the fucking semis look like at that point? Now you got a whole fucking team of uh, ladies fighting each other. They all now... Or no, no, wait a minute. Is that... No, oh, how does it work, though? Like, Yeah, they're going, all good. Yeah, it, it, what happens is if Melendez doesn't get any winners, then obviously he just sits out for the, uh, the semi-finale and the finale, so there wouldn't be anything that he could do about that because all his fighters... We're eliminated, but we're not going to say that's what does happen. But you know, in a hypothetical scenario, true, yeah. true. but like hypothetically, what the fuck does Melinda just get his bags and go home then? <laughs> I guess look, I guess they would have to stick around just in case one of the other girls got injured. So maybe one of the other girls from his team could come in and fill the spot. Well, that that will be interesting if Melendez is just kind of posted up at that point fucking drinking margaritas <laughs> because his whole team has been eliminated. He's like, yeah, you know, hey. We're just kicking it in Vegas, riding this thing out at this point. <laughs> no, knowing that guy, he's gonna be, he'll head back and go back to training. But uh, that would really suck. Even though I was training, for example, I, like I was uh, rooting for Verdum to go completely defeated. Eh, he didn't, whatever. But um, I, I would really suck to, to not see anybody who's in the Melendez camp. But I'm telling you right now, write it down, tattoo it on somebody, I don't give a fuck. Rose Namajunas will win this entire fucking competition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with what DFW was saying and uh, what uh, Ronda Rousey was saying, that's that's a that's a there's a good chance that might happen. Yeah, yeah. Listen, <clears throat> DW talks a lot of shit too. 
I'm a bigger Dana White fan as they come, but this is also the guy that nominated somebody to be the next Anderson Silva that turned mm -hmm. out being a male nurse. So well, that's yeah. a lot of pressure to put on on Uriah Hall, dude. You can't be telling that guy he comes in, you know, fresh off a uh, tough, and then hey, by the way, you're the next Anderson Silva. It's like, oh well, shit. Well, yeah, even Sony <laughs> was, Sony was doing that, that to him too. Dana White said that years ago, though. It was a cat oh, that oh. never even. He put that, you know, a long time ago, four or five seasons ago of Tough Man. Oh, okay, he said, cool. he said, there's a, it, it was the guy who was a male nurse on one of the seasons. I forget which season. Okay, and he had, I a male nurse. No shit. And he had, he had a, a matter of fact, I think he's a male nurse now. This whole UFC thing didn't work out for him, but he had a couple of big knockouts on, uh, you know, the 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 first rounds of that season. And Dana White came out and said, we got a, a – because a, 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 it was a 145 or, or 155. It was a smaller weight division, and a smaller Anderson Silva. And, you know, let's, he's promoting the season. Let's not yeah. get too crazy. Yeah, that's, that's, okay. that's, that's, that's a good point, yeah. Okay, one more thing I do want to talk about because I know we we got to go, like, right around 6 o'clock here. So um, you guys weren't able to join me on the last show there, but, uh, you know, I'm sure you probably – both probably saw the um, police Herrig Heather Joe Clark fight. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. I know you guys probably want to give your comments on that there, so go ahead and uh, speak about that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, like like we said going into it, man, it was a pretty. It ended up being a really good fight. Probably the second best fight of the season. Uh, Felice Herrig looked good. Her hands looked good. She was aggressive. Um, you know, it was what I expected of it. I, I, watching the first fight, it was a little. Surprising not seeing um, Heather Joe Clark throw some more kicks. I, I thought that she was a little bit uh, more effective using her kicks the first time they fought, and it didn't seem like she threw any kicks at all. And, uh, you know, it cost her. I think Felice Herrig's a better fighter. I thought that going into it, and she proved that to be the case. Did you yeah, think that agree. groundwork was awkward, though, in, in round one? What would you say, Rich? The, the groundwork in round one, I was kind of like looking at that going, what the fuck is going on? They were they were rolling in like a ball on the ground in some of those you know, exchanges on the ground in round one there. I just, I just thought that was really awkward. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that happens sometimes though, man. Shit gets stifled and you end up in an awkward position and, you know, stalemated. Happens. Yeah, I mean, in scrambles and jiu-jitsu when you're trying to roll on the ground and everything, it's uh, it's it's who's trying to go for submissions and you think they're trying to do something, so then you start, you start defending something. And uh, it happens all the time, <laughs> believe me. But uh, um, I definitely agree. Police definitely showed and proved pretty much everybody right in, in her ranking, right, that she is she was the more talented fighter. Again, though, if and I don't doubt Heather Joe Clark as far as saying that her knee was messed up because we saw in earlier episodes that she messed it up. But um, you know that might be one of the reasons she didn't throw any leg kicks because yeah, you're you know Fred's right. Those those leg kicks in that first fight were were pretty damn effective. And that's actually what I thought would be the key to her getting the win over Felice, getting an upset win, and getting Melendez's first win. And I thought it was a damn leg kicks. Uh, no knee, no kick. So that, that kind of sucks. Props to her for going out there with a messed up knee and, uh, and, and fighting her ass off trying to put on a show. And, and still she, you know, she survived for the most part. Yeah, yeah do, you guys, um, do you guys recall what the injury was for Tisha Torres? I don't know if it was a shoulder injury or what. No idea. But I, I did find the uh, – by the way, I did find their exchange – Apparently, Sparza uh, accused um, Torres of using performance-enhancing drugs, and there was this whole back-and-forth thing oh. about it. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's how you sling some fucking butt. I'll tell you what, this shit just got a lot more interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should have heard the rest of the comments. I didn't want to say them on the oh. show because they were pretty insulting. Man. Oh, they're pretty bad. They're pretty damn bad. Like, I'm just reading them here like, oh, shit, really? Like, okay. But, uh, hey, hey, yeah, it was basically that. Ain't us, Jack. We didn't say that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, doesn't, doesn't what she said there, Eddie, kind of go against the uh, the code of conduct that the UFC has? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's I mean, it's kind of personal between them two. But yeah, I mean, accusing another fighter of you know of using steroids and then and then uh, uh, you know saying a lot of those, uh, yeah, saying some of those other comments were yeah, like, the other comments are pretty fuck, man. You didn't expect that. I mean, I mean, I don't look, man. I'm not saying they don't have manners, but I don't know. I know they didn't teach that in little lady school, man. So uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't. But um, yeah, they were. They were. This person, they really don't like each other at all. Yeah, no hiding that fact. And and again, the reason that is is because uh, Tisha Torres wound up beating Felice Herrig in her uh, last fight that she had before coming to Tough. 
And that fight really messed with Felice's head, and she was actually thinking about quitting MMA and hanging up the gloves. So, mm. um, you know, so that's a big problem for Carla Esparza there when you're fucking with her best friend forever. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more thing I do want to mention here. Um, so Felice Herrig moves on, <clears throat> and in the next bracket matchup, she is going up against Randa Marcos. That's going to be an interesting fight. What do you guys think about that real briefly? <clears throat> yeah, man. That's going to be a real interesting fight. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really given a whole lot of thought to that, man. Uh, they both obviously looked really good in their first fights. Uh, ah, man. I guess I would give the slight edge to Felice just off the top of my head, but Ronda Marcos looked really good in her fight, man. Um, I don't know. I have to. I have to give it a little more thought. But just off the top of my head, I give a slight edge to Felice in that fight. Yeah, I'm leaning the other way. I think if if, uh, if uh, Marcos is is healthy, and, and and you know obviously she's been training the whole time. She's been training with our teammates and everything. But if she's healthy, I would give her the edge, but very slightly, very slightly. But I'll tell you what, that's going to be a hell of a fight. Yeah, and I actually like both of these girls, <clears throat> mm -hmm. but I too am leaning. Uh, with Eddie here, I, I'm leaning with Randall Marcos slightly at this point, but you know, again, we got a little more time to actually see what's happening on the show here. Probably an episode or two before they fight again, so maybe we'll get some insight on that before they actually have their fight. But yeah, I'm I'm going with Eddie there. I'm kind of leaning a slight edge towards Randall Marcos getting the win in that one. Yeah, it should be a really good fight though. Either way, I'm I'm super stoked for that one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a great uh, you know, semi-finale and finale there when all is said and done there, uh, done here because it, you know we're getting you know the the fighters that should be moving up and on they are in fact moving up and on in the uh, tournament here so it should be pretty great when the semi-finale and the finale comes I I actually can't wait to see who actually wins the title. Yeah. Doug Rose. Yeah. Thug motherfucking Rose. Let her bang, bro. Come on. Let her fight. <laughs> yeah, she just followed me on score. I was really surprised, too. No, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah hey, 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 if she watches this video, though, hey, look, uh, sweetheart, I know you're taking and I'll go, but I love you. Win the belt, please. I'm a fanboy, I know, but still, please win it. <laughs> yeah, there was a couple other ladies I was following over there on, uh, on score. I don't know if you guys, you guys have score accounts? Uh, I just started one for Crossbones MMA, so I'm, I'm still figuring out how it works, but uh, but yeah, I got one. Yeah, I mean, there was, you know, you get some of these ladies, they tell you, oh, go and like all of my fucking posts, and you go there and you like every single one, you spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes clicking like on every one of them, I'll follow <laughs> you, I'll follow you back, and then you fucking go through that whole mess, and they don't follow you back, it's like, fuck you, I'm, on, I'm on liking each and every one of them. <laughs> oh, man. No, I don't. I don't follow this. I know it's on Twitter. It happens a lot, so I don't even bother with it. I'm like, look. Well, man, the reason I do that is to support them because I don't know if you guys right, knew this. Yeah. Police Herrick made eight thousand nine hundred dollars from fucking Score. Fuck out of here! Doing what? Do promoting herself through Score. Holy so that's shit! Why I, I can get that money. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I go over there and I I try to promote the girls and try to help them out so they can get a little bit more sponsorship money. But when you get girls telling you to go over there and everybody that goes over there and likes my post now, I'll follow you back, and then you go and you fucking do it, and they don't. So oh, man. Everyone hey, that does that, I've gone in there and I've unliked every single fucking uh, post. <laughs> no, I mean, you got to think about it. A ton of people got to be on there doing the same thing, and they, they're just like, <laughs> yeah, they're like, follow, 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 oh, fuck it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so shit. that's the reason I do. Like I said, my score account I'm not using for the site or for the shows. I'm just doing it for Tough, you know, because uh, we're getting a good response for the shows on Tough that we're doing. So there's a lot of interest in you know the Tough 20 season, and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, like Eddie was saying earlier. I don't know if it's the women that are just emotional, but it seems like maybe the guys are emotional as well. <laughs> we we're getting you know some some pretty emotional responses from some of the things that we say and again when we say these things it's not we're hating on a fighter or you know we don't like them it's just you know we're expressing what we see as long-term MMA fans because you know probably all three of us has been watching you know have been watching MMA for you know at least two decades now you know yeah listen quickly before we go I gotta ask Eddie how disappointed are you that Kane got hurt man 
Um, I was nearing depression, maybe like five minutes after <laughs> I heard it. Uh, I opened a bottle of tequila, poured some out from a homie that's out. Um, then I heard Mark, Hunt, Mark Hunt is fighting, and it brought me back a little bit because I like Mark Hunt a lot. But, I mean, come on. You're in Mexico. You don't have cane? And then you hear yeah. Diego's out too. You're like, oh, fuck well, it. You're but like, but how, is that, how is that going to work out with Mark Hunt, though? Because is he still going to get an interim title shot if he's fucking – not making weight because the last I heard he's 300 freaking pounds. He's got to cut 37 oh uh, 37 or so pounds just to make weight. Um, uh, shit, I don't know if he's going to actually be able to do it. But uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, it, he's got, I like, what, three weeks, two weeks, something like that? Yeah, two weeks, a little over two weeks, right? Hey, man, if you treadmill, let me like 23 hours out of the day, you eat a little bit every, like, you know, four hours or so, like a tiny bit while you're still running on there, sleep for an hour, and just do that for three weeks straight, guarantee he makes that shit. But it's unhealthy as fuck. Yeah, 30 pounds, Mark Hunt's got that in the bag, Jack. Like, one good thing <laughs> about being one good thing about being 300 pounds is he's got a few to shed. Uh, yeah, fucking, James Irvin would make that in fucking 24 hours. <laughs> but what a, what a bust that would be, though, if he didn't make the weight yeah. and then the interim title was not on the line. <laughs> I mean, what would happen in that instance there? There wouldn't be an interim title fight, and then <laughs> Dana would have to come up with another fucking... interim title fight until Kane comes back. Dana White's fucking head would explode. That's what would happen. Yeah. I'm surprised that happened already. That guy has to have, like, the... He, okay, I'll say it right now. Dana White is the one American in the entire country, the entire world, who's most at risk for a heart attack every five days. Just yeah. for the fact that some shit always goes down. Every single week, something goes down where he's like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. it, it, like yeah. he should have I, – I just imagine he flies in a plane. He just doesn't tell anybody. But he flies in a plane with a ton of just weed everywhere. And he says to smoke yeah. out to relax because he's going to fucking die if he doesn't chill out for like five minutes. Yeah, man. That that had to be a fucking nightmare, finding out that oh. Kane fell out of that car. With like three weeks to go, their whole Mexican expansion, they got the whole fucking yeah. – the whole reality show built on that. I mean, I was. We just did a, a a little segment on one of the shows talking about which title fight we was most stoked for coming up, and fucking that was the one, man. Fuck yeah, me, that I was did. the fucking fight. I really wanted to see, man. Of course he get hurt. I was like, motherfucker. Well, from what I think I understand here, I thought I read something that said he already had the operation and that it's not going to be too much longer before he's back. So. No, 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 no. Let me let me let me let me clear that up right now, Jack. Um, I heard Javier Mendez today on the MMA Hour, and you're right. The surgery is done, but it was actually worse than what they thought, and uh, he could potentially be out for a little longer than they than they had first expected. That's well, what so Javier Mendez said. Today. Yeah, the comment that I saw was actually from Kane himself, so maybe he was whitewashing things a bit. Uh, he has to. His sponsors, fans, all that stuff. People watching him, hoping he comes back. He can't be saying, you know, I'll be out for three years like Dominic. You know, so. Yeah, I thought he, I thought he was not going to be back until probably, you know, the end of spring maybe. But with what Fred's saying, it sounds like it might be a little bit longer. In the, the way I see it, I think he's out till next fall, man. It sucks. That's almost a whole year. Um, uh, it's actually how long would that be? He'd be out for like two years at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would almost so. be two years completely. Yeah, it was last October when he fought. Uh -oh. Yeah, but and, you're, then, you're... and then what do they do? Then they're getting in that danger zone there where after two years they pull the, the uh, belt from the uh, the title holder. Yeah, they'll give him a chance and be like, hey, man, if you can stay healthy and you can fight, you keep your belt. But if you can, we're going to have to Dom Cruz you, man. Sorry. Yeah. But uh, right. you really, really suck. But uh, that's going to be a turnout. Yeah. We're going to Dom Cruz you. Yeah. So. That's what I was just about to say. That's totally a term now. You're getting crude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, guys, one more thing really quick. Um, DFW is supposed to be making some sort of announcement about a big uh, happening on November 17th. Hmm. And the speculation and rumor that I'm seeing and reading and hearing is that they're talking about it may possibly be the re-signing of Brock Lesnar. Oh, get the fuck out of here, really? Yeah. Nah, listen. That's what that's what people want it to be. Every time, one time Dana White sent out a fucking message saying that he had a fucking a uh, 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 a statement that was going to change the game. And don't get me wrong, it did. It was Lorenzo Fertitta deciding to join the UFC full time. But mm. you know, most of us fans right here going, well, who gives a fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> who the fuck is Lorenzo Fertitta? Like, we thought you signed Fedor, man. What the fuck is this? Yeah, so, right. 
So what, do you, what do you guys think of Brock Lesnar? Oh man, if he's uh, healthy, I mean, look, I, I've watched. Uh, I watched. I don't watch much wrestling at all. I, I can't. I'm not a big fan of the, you know, of the. Oh, you fuck my girlfriend. Now we got a fight storyline that they do once in a while. But um, Brock Lesnar looks healthy as shit. He looks stronger. And to, to borrow from Jim Ross, he looks scarier than he did the first time he got to the UFC. So, and he's healthy. He has no diverticulitis supposedly. So, um, yeah, they got him back. It's a huge addition to to the UFC. And and you know. Bet money that if uh, if they they're able to do that, Cain Velasquez Brock Lesnar rematch, um, Dana White's gonna see dollar bills everywhere. I would love to see him get come back, so just so I can watch him get his ass beat by all the yeah. And and uh, Shane Carwin said he would actually come out of retirement to fight him again because he said I was fucking robbed in that fight, and I agree with him. I mean, any other fighter other than Brock Lesnar, that fight would have been stopped. Calling out Brock Lesnar is the new black. Everybody's doing that. <laughs> Alistair Overeem called out Brock Lesnar, and he threw him a beating in his last fight. I think everybody knows that Brock Lesnar's the cash cow, man. If they could actually get Brock Lesnar back, that would be fucking awesome because dudes busters no matter what. Mm -hmm. But realistically, you know, as far as him competing at the highest level of mixed martial arts, or not, I think that boat has sailed. Yeah. I don't think he likes getting punched in the face. Oh, no uh, way. You know, That's a, evident in every fight that he's ever gotten hit in. Yeah, and I mean, some of his wins, you know, Heath Herring is <laughs> wrangling snakes in Texas. Randy Couture is working for fucking Bellator. Well, I mean, he actually started a new MMA venture down in uh, South America called Extremo Combate. I spoke to him and interviewed him a while ago. I believe it was last year I spoke to him. Well, either way, I wish him all the best, but, you know, point is, Brock Lesnar, I think, was a, I don't know, I don't want to say he got lucky, but I think he had a really great run of opponents to the belt, you know, Heath Herring was a, a big fight at the time, but was that Heath Herring's last professional mixed martial arts fight? I'm not sure, I don't recall, but I know that when he was coming into the UFC, he was supposed to be, and I even mentioned this to me, he said, well, I don't know about that, but, you know, the way that DFW was touting him, coming into the UFC, he was supposed to have an impact on the heavyweight division. And I mentioned that to him, and he said, well, I don't know about that, because I don't think I was going to have an impact on the heavyweight division. So, Yeah, I mean, he was a he was a tough, tough guy, for sure. He was a big guy. He hit hard. But, I mean, I'm just saying, looking back on it, hindsight's always 50-50, or 20-20. But, um, you know, he, he ended up not fighting again after that. Randy Couture was a bit, you know, after his expiry date. And he was yeah. undersized compared to Bob Yeah, yeah and, and, and way undersized. Don't get me wrong. If they can sign him, they'll jump all over it, and they should. He was fun to watch, but at the end of the day, I just think that, you know, I think he got into mixed martial arts a little late in the game. He's a massive man. He's got great wrestling, and he's super strong, but he wasn't conditioned to being hit. And he, you know, other than that fucking Hail Mary punch he landed on Heath Herring, he never really done anything with his striking either, so, you know, I'd love to see him back just for the entertainment value, but quite frankly, for me, like, he's, he's a little more than Bob Sapp at this point, like, for real. <laughs> I'm not a fan of his. I never have been a fan of his, and the only reason I would want to see him back is to watch him get his ass beat by the three guys who beat the hell out of him last time. <laughs> that's the one thing, though. I would love to see like a like a revenge fight, you know. Uh, Alistair Overeem with the glass chin takes on you know Brock Lesnar. Uh, that'd be fun for me to watch because I don't really care much for Overeem. Uh, I don't care for much for either guy, but if you know, I would love to see Brock Lesnar come back, knock out Overeem, diss Bud Light again, talk about drinking Coors Light, and then have to apologize for it again in the press conference. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that. And then I'd love to see Shane Carwell come out of retirement and fight Brock Lesnar. Yeah. The one thing about Shane Carwin, though, is that I would feel horrible having to watch him. Just knowing that he's in training camp, I would feel horrible for Shane Carwin. Man, that guy's body has been through hell and back like ten times over. Yeah. So to have yeah, to, it was you know, injuries with him that actually forced yeah. him out, right? Exactly. That dude's taking a lot. He used to be one of my favorite fighters, and it just it just really sucked to see him uh, go out the way he did. Yeah, man, I loved him, too. I thought he was going to be a lot yeah. bigger and have more of an impact on the division there, but when he got hurt, I was like, shit. Yeah. And then I think a lot, a lot of that, you know, with the Brock Lesnar fight, where I don't know about you guys, man, but when, you know, a fighter has a man on the ground and he throws 77 ground strikes and 46 of them get through, 
I do not call that intelligently defending yourself. And, you know, that must have taken a big chunk out of, you know, Shane Carwin's will to want to continue fighting because, I mean, when you look at that, man, come on. If that was any other fighter, that fight would have been stopped. I mean, we see fights where guys take six or seven shots on the ground out of maybe ten, and they fucking stop the fight, you know? Yeah, they should. I mean, they should have stopped the fight. And I, just like I said, they should have stopped that fight. Um, but I think the, the part that stopped it was Brock Lesnar smiling or laughing, and the ref might have seen that and be like, oh, he's fine, whatever. But he still wasn't defending himself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah when you when 46 shots out of 77 get through, yeah. that's not defending. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. Obviously, they shouldn't have stopped the fucking fight, <laughs> you know. He wasn't asleep, and he went on to fucking yeah. defeat that man. Well, Two minutes later, he has to build up in, in fucking Shane Corwin's arms. He couldn't hold his fucking arms up in the second yeah. round. Yeah, well, be all that as it may, Brock Lesnar got on the stool and then he made the walk back out to the middle of the cage and submitted him. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, the so I guess, up, I guess that was Lesnar. one time when the strategy of using your face to block punches was a good one. It uh, worked. It worked. Oh, Korean zombie. Who else does that? <laughs> um, who else does that? I know that works too. Fuck, I don't know. Maybe like one person in the history of humanity, but still. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. But uh, um, yeah, Brock Lesnar depends. I don't know. Hopefully, he, if he comes back, I hope to see an improved strike game. But um, I think Frank Muir said he'd fight him too. But Frank needs yeah, to just did. shut up yeah. and relax. Just go sit down and have iced tea somewhere because he's, he's done. Yeah, he's only That's got what one I mean. fight. I think he's only got one fight left on his contract. Uh, yeah. Here. All right, guys, we want to talk about one more thing real quickly here because we went way off topic from tough, but uh, this is more breaking MMA news as well. Um, Anderson Silva had a meeting with DFW and Fertitta, and they tore up the contract that had eight fights left on it, and now he's re-signed for 15 additional fights now. He's going to go another 15 fights in the UFC at 39 years old. Sure. Uh, <laughs> what do you guys think of that real quickly? My only question is, why didn't they sign one for 30? I mean, <laughs> what the fuck, right? Anderson should have just signed a 50-fight contract and tried to get as much money as possible. There's no fucking way he fights 15 more times. So I don't... It's complete hyperbole. <laughs> what the fuck, like... I mean, you know... I think I think the only reason they did that was to totally lock him up, so should he not be able to continue or want to quit, he can't do anything. And I don't know how long the wait-out period is on the contracts. I'm... I'm going to guess it's you know a couple of years, three years, and probably differs on every contract. But uh, I guess what they're doing is hoping they can keep him as long as he can remain fighting. And then, should he not be able to fulfill the 15 fights, they'll be able to at least stop him for a few more years until he's so old he won't be able to fight anymore. No, no, yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. <clears throat> they, they they just wanted a lot of people. He, they just wanted him for the rest of his career, no matter what. Bellator is actually starting to throw a little bit of money around, and yeah. and I think they just wanted to make sure. That nothing fucking crazy happens. Yeah, man, Hoist Gracie just joined Bellator. You know, who, who's to say that uh, Anderson Silva want to head over there to co you know collect a couple more checks once he's done? But uh, when I saw this, you know, this this thing about the 15 fight contract, when Brett Favre came back a couple times, he went to the Jets and the Vikings and all that shit. Um, I made a prediction. I said Brett Favre was gonna die on the field uh, on a blitz, just get totally massacred and just die on the field, right? He retired just in time for that not to happen. Um, I'm hoping Anderson Silva retires before he dies in the cage. That old fuck is crazy. You silly, silly person. Stop it. Stop it. You're not going to fight 15 times. Chill out. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm really surprised it is coming back because when I first saw that injury and, and heard you know, about his mindset, uh, Fred and I spoke about this on the last show, um, but when I heard his mindset, he wasn't coming back and he wasn't going to fight for the title again. Then he is coming back and he doesn't want to fight for the title. He's moving on. He doesn't want to be the champ anymore. And then he all of a sudden he's walking around on his foot uh, after you know climbing stairs after a month and and then he's saying he's coming back and he's going to have another fight but he wants to fight not for the belt but he wants to fight Nick Diaz um, and then he even after that he said well maybe I'll even go up and wait and move up to light heavyweight I mean so I mean he's been all over the friggin place with what he wants to do and what he's been saying so I mean who the hell knows what happens I mean uh, as far as the fight with Diaz goes in uh, at UFC 183 in, in January. Um, I know Fred and I, I think we both said we think that uh, Anderson Silva wins by TKO. Uh, I think I said in two. I don't know what Fred said. But, uh, Eddie, what do you think happens in that matchup? 
Uh, I don't even have to think about it. Nick Diaz, my friends. Nick Diaz, talking 209. What? Um, he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna win. <laughs> Diaz How is he gonna, gonna win? win? Diaz wins his first decision ever, ever. The only one that counts <laughs> against you Anderson. Think, so. Really, you think it goes to a decision? Yeah, man. Nick Diaz don't get knocked out by nobody. He don't get submitted by anybody. Nick oh, Diaz man. comes to fight. Oh man. I know, yeah. I'm, biased, I'm biased as hell. I don't give a fuck. Nick Diaz, son, he's going to win. <laughs> Fred, well, refresh me on what your opinion was the other day. I think we both said we agreed it was going to be a TKO for Anderson Silva. I think I said two. I don't recall what Yeah, you yeah. Said. <clears throat> I mean, I think that obviously, you know, I think Anderson's bigger, and um, I think that Anderson's a better striker. I will say that I'll give you this, Eddie. You're right. Um, Nick Diaz don't get finished by no goddamn body, man. And, and I did bring up this point to Rich. Um, you know, I, I think Anderson will win by being bigger and a better technical striker and Nick Diaz uh, not being a bitch and yeah. refusing to, to fight smartly against Anderson. <laughs> Nick Diaz will stand up and throw them things with him for sure, and I think it's a bad idea. But that being said... Anderson coming back off of a horrible injury, a long layoff, and in this weird spot where he's no longer the king, I would not be surprised to see Diaz weather an early storm and start lighting him up to the body late in the fight and actually finish Anderson Silva. As crazy as that sounds, late in the fight with some real hard body work with Nick Diaz's fucking face gushing blood, I would not. it wouldn't be the most surprising thing, man. It really would I mean, yeah, look, look at Anderson. Anderson Silva doesn't doesn't go to t decisions. He's not really had to go into that fourth and fifth round and dig deep to uh, to take on you know to, to beat guys you know by decision. But um, except maybe you know Sun and obviously beat Sun in that one fight. But uh, Nick Diaz has tanked for ten rounds, twelve rounds, fifteen. He doesn't give a shit. He'll he'll come for the entire fight at the same pace the entire fight. Can Anderson Silva keep up with that? We don't know. Um, a finish is possible, but even I doubt that a little bit. Um, I think uh, Diaz will light him up enough in the entire fight to to get a decision win, and I'm kind of hoping that's what happens. But if he finishes Anderson Silva, hell, I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm thinking actually. I think Fred and I spoke about this where we said we think that uh, you know Nick Diaz probably will try to strike and and stand there and do his MMA boxing with him. But the bad thing about that is that Nick Diaz does not really have that knockout punching power where you know his his striking is you know a cumulative type punishment mm -hmm. and you know when we're looking at, at Anderson Silva I mean like I told Fred the other day we've seen Anderson Silva knock out light heavyweights with a friggin jab you know so you're looking at a guy who you know can hit with some heavy hands versus a guy that's going to do a cumulative punching and then I, I don't know man I, you know I like Nick Diaz don't get me wrong um, but I just think if he stands there and he strikes He's going to get knocked the fuck out, like Fred said. I can see his face getting all bloodied up like it did in the old days before he had that surgery to stop all of that blood and guts coming out of his face when the fights <laughs> used to have in the old days. But, yeah, I see uh, if he just decides to stand there and bang, I see him getting all bloody like we used to see him, like, maybe uh, 10 years ago when he was, you know, first in the UFC way back when because I think Anderson Silva will tear that face open with the heavy hands that he has. Very possible, yeah. All right, guys. We went all over the place on this show uh, here. Any other comments? No, sir. Uh, uh, Doug Rose. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, good luck to Rose now, Eunice. There, we're we're all rooting for you here. I think we're all fans of yours. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. I do want to thank everybody for listening. Like I said, we're getting a lot of interest in the tough shows that we're doing, and uh, we appreciate it, people. If you do want to, you know, come on the show and discuss things with us, uh, we do have kind of like an open format on the shows that we do. So you just have to go over to MMA Chat, create an account, let us know you want to be on the show, and then we'll give you access to the part of the site where we actually plan the shows out. Um, so thanks again, people, for listening. We appreciate it. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Fred, for being here. I always have a great time when you two guys show up, and uh, it's always interesting when you two guys are on the show. Oh. All right. Yes, sir, guys. We'll see you guys around. All righty, guys. Have a good one, man. All Thanks right. for showing up again. I appreciate it. Yep. Later, Later fellas. All right. Bye-bye.
Eddie, what do you think? All right, man. Now this is a fight that when I saw the matchup, I gotta say I was a little bit upset because I kind of wanted to see him uh, face off later in later rounds, not necessarily now, because of the wealth of, of experience that both of these ladies have. Uh, except Magana, 30 years old, a mountain of experience. Daly, 26 years old, and has a mountain of experience on her own, especially with the team that she trains with, and and like Fred said, uh, took fights at a higher weight than she is now. Now. Here's the thing about it: is this, this fight is so evenly matched in my mind. I mean, um, I believe uh, I think Daly has a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. I, I think it's, that's what it is. Um, Maganya has, is very, very slick on the ground, just like Fred said. But the stand up that both of these ladies have it might make this fight interesting. If you're watching any of the uh, the Daly fight, she doesn't really shy away from any from any uh, from contact. She, she, in fact, she she prefers it. But uh, she's also very, very smart, and she does like to uh, take people down and just basically you know, win by submission the way she's, she's done most of her, most of her fights. Um, Magani, on the other hand, uh, has that Thailand training. Now, again, you know, she, isn't, she hasn't been there that long, so she hasn't picked up what we expect out of you know, professional Thai fighters as far as the skill on, on the feet, but she has improved quite a bit. Um, as far as the fight goes, I hate to pick it because, again, I wanted, to fight, I wanted to fight later in the later rounds. Um, but uh, I would actually have to go with with daily by submission. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna agree with you more than I am with Fred there. Not that you know Fred doesn't have valid points and everything that he said, um, but uh, my breakdown here was looking at their records. It would be anybody's guess as to who wins if the fight goes to a decision, because both of the ladies you know have gone to decision, and uh, it's it's hard to tell if it goes to a decision, you know. You know, would they be split decisions more than likely? Yes. Um, so, okay. We should be live in a moment. And it looks like we are live. Hello, and welcome to the MMA Live Chat Show. I'm Rich Davey, and it's Tuesday, October 28th, 2014. On today's show, we'll be discussing the Tough 20 Episode 6 show featuring the match between Isling Daly and Angela Magana. And maybe we'll chat a bit about the episode 5 show that featured the fight with Felice Herrig and Heather Joe Clark. On today's show we have yours truly, Fred Kirby, and Eddie Law. Thanks for taking part in another show, guys. I appreciate you all taking the time to be here and joining me to discuss the Tough 20 episode 6 show and for sharing your thoughts on the matchup between Isling Daly and Angela Magana. Go ahead and say hello to anybody that might be listening, guys. Yo, what's up, Eddie? What's happening, Rich? Hey, what's up, fellas? What's going on? <clears throat> okay. Well, I'm doing good, fellas. Glad you guys could make it. I truly appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. The Tough 20 Episode 6 show featuring the matchup between Isling Daly and Angela Magana takes place Wednesday, October 29th, 2014 on the Tough 20 Episode 6 show and will be on Fox Sports 1 starting at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Okay, Isling Daly versus Angela Magana. We have uh, the 26-year-old Isling Daly, who has a record of 14 and 3 in hails from Ireland. In the season one opener, she was ranked or seeded number five by the powers that be. And then we have the 30-year-old Angela Magana, hailing from the USA with a record of 11 and 6. And in the season opener, she was ranked or seeded number 12. Um, obviously, Isling Daly is the favorite here as she is the higher ranked fighter in this matchup. But uh, both of these fighters have a little more experience than uh, some of the other ladies, or most of the other ladies in the house, actually. Um, so this should prove to be an exciting fight. Uh, as a matter of fact, I noticed on Facebook last night that Isling Daly posted a comment stating that the fight was an exciting one. And I thought that I had read. Uh, that she made a comment about it being the most exciting fight to date, but when I went back today to get that exact quote, I couldn't find it. So okay. maybe, that, maybe that was in my imagination there, but <laughs> there was a comment from Isaac Daly that read, tune in this Wednesday, Thursday, but only if you want to be really entertained. Um, both of these ladies have fought some tough competition over the years. Daly has fought Sheila Gaff, uh, Rosie Sexton, uh, Barb Honchak, and Lisa Ellis, who is also on the season of Tough, but she came up short in each of those matches, um, losing by a unanimous decision in three rounds to uh, Sexton, Han Chek, and uh, Lisa Ellis, and uh, my first round TKO to Sheila Gap back in 2011. Uh, coming into this fight, she has a win by submission of the fight that took place on December 31st, 2013, 
and her record for the last couple of years is one win and three losses. So uh, it looks like maybe she's trying to get back on the um, the winning train here. Uh, I'm not sure why, but the fight record on tough is a little bit different than what Share Dog's Fight Finder is showing. So I'm going to go with uh, Share Dog here since their info is a little bit more comprehensive. On Share Dog's Fight Finder page for daily, she has 14 wins. Five by KO or TKO, seven by submission, and two by decisions. And in her loss column, uh, she has five losses, one by KO, TKO, and then four by decision. Uh, looking at Angela Gagne, Angela has fought some pretty tough competition as well. She has three fights against Jessica Aguilar, uh, losing two of those three matches. And her win over... Them in Ireland. And uh, she's been there forever, too. She's actually, like you said, she's been on the circuit for a very long time. She's got a lot of experience. And um, <clears throat> I think she's even taken a lot of fights, or quite a few fights, uh, above this weight category. So I think that she'll be pretty strong for the weight division. Um, I think that her, her use of pressure and uh, uh, forward movement in her hands is going to be a big factor in this fight. Angela Magana is interesting because <clears throat> she just shot this documentary where she went to Thailand uh, to train Muay Thai, and she decided to stay because she fell in love with the art and Thailand and whatnot. Um, but watching her fights, uh, I can kind of see why she went to Thailand. Uh, <laughs> she's actually rather slick on the ground, and most of her wins kind of submission, or quite a few, rather. And... Um, her striking was a bit rudimentary, and it looks like it's actually helped her out a lot going to Thailand. Obviously, it's tightened up her striking a lot. Um, but her striking isn't necessarily as great as one would might think with her living in Thailand. As far as them matching up together, um, I just see Daly applying a lot of pressure, as she does in her fights. I see her coming forward and not really stopping. Um Magania can be pretty crafty off of her back, but I think that Daly has been around long enough to not get caught in something stupid. And uh, she's an aggressive fighter, too, so I, I just see Daly coming out, putting a ton of pressure on her, driving her up against the fence, eventually getting the takedown, and uh, pretty much maul dogging her. Um, I think Daly is going to get a first round TKO finish and make a statement with this fight. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay, Jessica Aguilar was uh, the third of the three fights that they had together. So the last fight that she had with her, she did win that fight against uh, Jessica Aguilar, who's, I believe, the champion over at Bellator right now. Um, and uh, let's see. Jessica Aguilar, uh, she won by majority decision. And that was back on January 16th of 2009. She, she also has fought Bob uh, Barba Honchak, and she won by split decision uh, back in 2009. So we got one fighter that has the win over Barb, and another one has a loss. Um, but she also uh, has losses to uh, Jessica Penny, Jessica I, and Stephanie, I'm going to get this lady's wrong, name wrong here because I always do, Stephanie Agink. Um, two by submission and one by unanimous decision. So I guess it's a good thing that she's uh, not fighting another fighter with the name of Jessica in this matchup <laughs> because that's four of her six losses to fighters with the first name of Jessica. <laughs> and over at Share Dog, uh, her record is the same as what they were showing on Tough there. Um, she has 11 wins, two by KO or TKO, six by submission, and three by decision. And in her loss column, she has six losses, four by submission, and two by decision. So the two fighters are pretty evenly matched here, which should make for a great fight here. And, and uh, Fred, give me your comments, uh, comments on this matchup here, and uh, who do you think comes out the winner, and how do you think it's going to end? Well, like you said, um, Isling Daly is the favorite, and uh, I would rate her as the favorite going into this fight. I think that's uh, rightfully given that she's great. Uh, Isling Daly's got an interesting style, man. She... Um, she uses lots of pressure, lots of forward movement. Um, she tra trains out of the same camp as Conor McGregor, the straight blast 